It's pretty powerful watching God over time, lots of conferences, places, arenas, stadiums, fields, auditoriums, and he does it every time. He comes by the power of his spirit and he uses human instruments to weave a story together for us in passion. And sit back and watch that happen is one of the miracles of life. You would think that Christine Kane and John Piper and Beth Moore and Francis Chan and myself and Levi all sat in a room and said, okay, here's what I've got. You take it here, you take it there, you pick it up here, you, you build on that, you unfold that. But we don't do that. We seek the Lord, do our best, we show up, and then God does all of that. And isn't it amazing to sit under the Word of God and watch the Spirit of God put brick on top of brick on top of brick and then just build a house of truth right in front of us? Is that not an amazing thing to sit and watch God do that? So if you're thinking you guys are really good programmers to make all that happen, it just so happens we know the programmer who makes everything happen. And to watch the Holy Spirit weave those messages together and what is to come, it's been staggering for all of us, I think, but for those of us behind the scenes, maybe even more so for you. And I couldn't be more grateful to be in an ocean of God's sovereignty like that tonight. And to really just pray what has been already prayed for you already today, that God would do something powerful in this moment. We don't really need another message. Most of us don't need a lot more messages. A lot of us just need to move forward in the things that God has spoken into our lives. And that's not to knock preaching, because I'm a preacher, obviously, and I hope to preach until I see Jesus. But at the same time, we already all know enough to change history. I just pray today that God will change you. And that all across this stadium, people's lives will change in the next few minutes because what we're focusing on together is the devastating beauty of the cross. So Francis led us to Ephesians chapter one to a powerful prayer of the Apostle Paul. And he said, I've been praying this for you, so I don't know if that encouraged you or not to know that while you were getting your stuff together and getting your crew together that Francis was praying for you days before you arrived here that God would do something powerful in your life. Beth said that she was hoping for a phenomena that God would do for all of us what we hoped that he would normally do for some of us, namely an awakening. And it was beautiful to hear Francis step into that because my text is a few verses down in Ephesians chapter three it's the second prayer that Paul prays in the letter of the Ephesians to the Ephesians, and I thought, man, we're gonna get both of these prayers over us tonight, and the beauty is as we've been praying prayer number one, which that God would open our eyes to see, and then I've been praying, we've been praying that he would do this second prayer, that he'd open our ability to grasp what is right in front of us. A moment in time changed history. Namely, the moment when the Son of God gave his life on a cross for all of your wrong and all of my wrong and all of humanity's wrong. And once and for all, finally completed the work of atoning for all of our sin. That's the moment that changed history, coupling that, of course, with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. There are two events, but it's one thing. Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead to triumph over death and give us the gift of everlasting life. And both of those things together are the gospel. And so if I say the cross tonight, I'm implying that Jesus is alive and he's in this stadium right now with us because he came out of the tomb by the power of the God of God and he is alive in this place right now, more powerful than death, more powerful than the grave, more powerful than all darkness. 
And so if we say resurrection, we mean cross, and if we, sing, we say cross, we mean resurrection because it's all one and the same. But the hope tonight is not just that there was a moment in time where Jesus Christ gave his perfect, innocent life for you. What matters tonight is, can you see it? And secondly, do you believe it? Can you see it, and do you believe it? I think at Passion 2017, we've done our part to help people see the cross. We put a 232-foot-long and 154-foot-wide cross in the middle of the Georgia Dome. We have sung songs since we arrived here about the cross. A few of them this morning, the cross changes everything this afternoon. I want to praise the God of Calvary. Late last night, the cross meant to kill is my victory. So we have put a cross in the middle of the stadium. We have purposely sung songs that rally us around the cross. The messages spoken have been about the cross. So I'm thinking Passion 2017, we, we've been about... We've done about all we can do to make it about the cross so that it can be seen and believed. But it really doesn't matter what we've done. It really matters what God has done. And God has placed a symbol, an immovable symbol, in the middle of history, namely Calvary. He did that. And so in the middle of every human story and in the middle of all of human story, is the place where Jesus died. There was never anything like it before that moment, and there's never been anything like it since that moment, and everything that was wrecked before that moment had the possibility of being made right after that moment, and for every need in this stadium today, there's one place that you go to get what you need, and it's back to that central place in time where Jesus Christ gave his life for you. But the question tonight is, do you see it? Not, do you see this stage? Not, did you see the words on the screen? Not, have you heard the story? But have your eyes and your heart been open? When I was a college student in Atlanta, my pastor, Charles Stanley, was teaching at a college retreat we did. I've shared this story before. St. Simon's Island, just a regular Methodist campground college weekend camp. You've been to one similar to it. He was teaching on Saturday night about the gifts of the Spirit. But somehow, in the middle of his message on the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, at the end of his message, un unexpectedly and unplanned, and, and of no doing of my own, sitting on the last row with about 175 college students, my eyes were open just like that to the cross of Jesus Christ. I didn't see it coming. It wasn't in my schedule of events. We, it, this is old school, so we were gonna build your own banana split right after this. That was the big thing back in the day, and uh, you could get all the flavors you wanted, all the toppings you wanted, and just go crazy and do your own thing. And so that was right on the horizon, and everybody was pretty excited about that. At the end of a long Saturday, I sat in a heap in my chair, tears rolling down my face, sobbing, my friends who didn't have this particular moment are looking at me like, what is going on? Uh, what, what happened to you? I can't even look up. I don't, I don't even engage them because somehow in a moment, not these eyes, but these eyes were opened up and I saw me and I saw Christ and I saw what he paid for me, what he did for me, what he bled for me, what he gave for me, what was exchanged for me and it wrecked into my world like nothing I'd ever seen before, and for an hour I couldn't move out of my chair. Everyone left the room and went to the banana split deal, and maybe an hour or more later when I kinda opened my eyes, I was the only person sitting in the room. And I don't know how God does that, why, when, 
he does that. But that's what Paul is praying for, these believers in Ephesus. A moment like that. So that you could spend the rest of your life saying, I've seen it. And walk into a place where you could say, and I believe it. Because even seeing it isn't complete unless you believe what you see. So if you look up the word devastating in the dictionary, it means to do great damage to someone or something. But there is a more a colloquial use of the word in the vernacular, just common usage among people. And devastating beauty isn't an oxymoron, it's an understood phrase. And if you look it up in more of the common dictionary, devastating beauty means something that's impressive, something that's effective, something that's attractive. In other words, when she walked in the door, I was devastated by her beauty. When I saw him on his Instagram, I was devastated by his character and heart and what he was saying about his love for God and the world. <laughs> And he was cute. And he made me, made my ankles buckle and I was a little weak in the knees. That's the way we use the term devastating beauty, but I would like to put both the words together, the destroying part of devastating and the stunningly beautiful part of devastating into the same word to rally around the devastating beauty of the cross. And this prayer, Paul prays, is found in Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 14. He starts the prayer, if you have time later, in verse 1, and he gets sidetracked by an amazing idea, and he goes off on a little tangent from verse 2 to verse 13, and then he comes back and says, oh, but what I was saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So the end of this prayer, the takeaway on this prayer is, we're walking around on planet Earth filled up with the full measure of God in the Spirit and in Christ. We're not cruising through life quarter tank, but we're cruising through life tapped in to the full power, the full authority, the full vision, character, mission, and purpose, and truth of who God is by the Spirit in Christ. In other words, when Paul prayed for this church and for all of us, he was praying in his mind that because of what Christ did for us on the cross, coming out of the tomb, that we wouldn't walk through life half empty, but we would walk through this life miraculously filled to the fullness of God in our lives. And if that seems like it's a million miles away, it may look like that tonight, but don't let the enemy deceive you in thinking, that's not a reality, that's not a possibility, that's not an option for me, I'm just gonna settle down to about 40% faith, and if I can manage that, Louis, being, you know, who I am, where I am, and what I've come through, that's going to be pretty good for me. Don't buy into that because that's not what God is praying for you tonight. God is praying for you that you will see something that will allow you to believe something so that then you can walk in something and the end result of your life is a full life, a full of God life. Jesus did not come to this earth so that we could get some of him and then sort of 
stumble our way to the finish line. The miracle is God's power in jars of clay right now. So yes, we have cracks, and yes, we're all dealing with our issues, but they don't overwhelm the all-surpassing power of Christ by the Spirit. It is oozing out of every crack and working its way into the story of every issue in our lives. Paul, writing this prayer, was stunned by the devastating beauty of the cross. So much so that he said, one page over, in the previous letter, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. How's that for a life? I'm not gonna do a backflip over anything more than over the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's gonna be my boast in life. That's gonna be what I stand on, what I talk about, what my hope is in, what my message is wrapped around. That's gonna be what emanates from my life story is what happened when history changed and when my history changed. He said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I also have been crucified to the world. So what was it about the cross that devastated Paul, and what is it about the cross that devastates us with beauty that we've never imagined before? God, open our eyes to see. A few things. Number one, the cross is devastatingly beautiful because it is the place where dead people come to life again. It is the only place where dead people come to life again. If you look in between the two prayers, chapter one and chapter three, you see the problem in chapter two, verse one. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. So we'll say it one more time joyfully. The gospel is not that sin makes you bad. It's way worse than that. Sin does not make you a bad person. Sin makes you a spiritually dead person. And here's the problem with that. Dead people can't do anything to help themselves. So any notion of religion, any notion of effort, any notion of I'm gonna be a better person, any notion of I'm gonna make it right with God, any notion of I'm gonna change my direction and I'm gonna somehow get on the right track and I'm gonna start doing more good things than bad things, there's no way that's gonna happen because without Christ, we're not bad, we're dead and dead people can't do anything to help themselves. But this is the gospel and that's why you never get over it. That's why even when you're old, you're still fired up about the message of the cross and the resurrection because Jesus, did not leave his throne in heaven, set foot on planet Earth to make bad people good. He came to do what he alone could do. He left the glory of heaven to step into the manger of Earth so that he could bring dead people out of the grave and back to everlasting life again. And he knew he was the only one who could do that. And he did it by the power of the cross. It says right in this text, you were dead in your sins in which you formerly lived when you used to follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, what a glorious word. When we were dead, God said, wait, just a minute. When we could not help ourselves, God said, but, that's not all. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive, not good. Yes, we wanna live lives that reflect the goodness of God. Of course we do, but that wasn't the work of the cross 
The work of the cross was to make us alive from the dead. He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. That's why he writes a few chapters later when he's talking about us living a life that reflects that we see and believe the cross. You know, we've spent a lot of time in the current generation trying to prove to the world that we understand them and we can relate to them and in a lot of ways that we're like them. I think we have a complex being followers of Jesus in the modern world. We want everybody to know that we're okay, that we're normal, that we're not some wacko, and that we're cool, that we get it, that we can hang with anybody, we know what's up, we know what's going on. And I think we've done a really good job probably of proving to our town, our campus, our dorm mates, our friends, our family that, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I, I, I still get it, you know? But there's a day coming when the pendulum needs to swing a little way and we don't say, hey, I can hang with the world. The invitation more is the other way and it says to the world, why don't you come and hang with me? See, we're over here walking in light. We're over here walking in joy. We're over here not regretting things after the fact. We're over here with some satisfaction going on and some stability even when things get crazy. We're over here with true love and true ideals about what love can be. We're over here with, um, with mouths filled with real songs of joy and praise. And we're over here in a community where we really do care for each other and we don't stab each other in the back and we don't drop each other off when it gets convenient. Why don't you come over out of the dark and join us over here in the light. And that's where Paul's going in this book. He starts with, here's who you are in Christ. You got a brand new identity. He comes to the next chapter and says, that's good news because you were dead, but now you're alive. And then he comes into chapter three and says, I want you to grasp the height, the length, the breadth, and the depth of the love of Christ so that you can be filled to the fullness of God. And then he shifts gears and says, and if you do, everything's gonna change. You're gonna take off the old man and you're gonna put on the new man. You're gonna do away with the old way of life and you're gonna embrace a brand new way of life. And then he gets to chapter five and he starts getting real specific about what that looks like. He says, as dearly loved children of God, walk in love and be imitators of your heavenly father. Do what he would do, say what he would say, walk like he would walk. You know why? Because you got heavenly DNA in you by spiritual birth. So when you went from death to life, mama and daddy weren't in the equation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were in the equation. So when you put your faith in Jesus, you got heaven DNA in your spirit. So your capability now is enormous. You can grow up and do more than just look like dad and look like mom. You can grow up into the likeness of your heavenly Father who has put his DNA in you by the Spirit in Christ. And when he gets to chapter five, he gets in the middle of it and I, he's talking to us. He's not talking to people out in clueless land. He's writing this to the church. And in the middle of it, he says, wake up, oh sleeper. Now the problem here we're gonna see isn't that we're asleep because the next line says, rise from the dead. So the gospel invitation is that you may be asleep, but it's a troubling sleep. It's the sleep of spiritual death. He says, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and here's how it happens. And Christ will shine on you. Passion exists. Because after 10 years of ministry on a campus, Shelly, myself, and our team were heartbroken that 20 million plus people on every college campus in America tonight, the vast majority of them are sound asleep. And what you're sitting in right now is the answer to a prayer that said, dear God in heaven, please wake up this collegiate generation. 
not from a nap. Wake them up out of the grave to life and light in Jesus. Your sweet mates are asleep. Your classmates are asleep in spiritual death. Your professors are asleep. Your sorority sisters, a lot of them are asleep. The guys on the lacrosse team, a bunch of them are asleep. And the story of the cross isn't, hey, do you wanna come to church with me? That happens later. The story of the cross isn't, hey, do you wanna you know, try to become a better person. The story of the cross is Jesus made a way by his death and burial that all of us who put our faith in him could have our sins forgiven and could come up out of death into everlasting life. If anything in your heart says, I wanna truly be alive, I can take you to the place where that happens. It is the devastating beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's our prayer tonight because it's likely, it's likely that there's some people sleeping in here tonight. And by the kindness of God, your eyes will be open. And before this session is over, you will say yes to the gift of God in the person of Christ on the cross. The second reason why it's devastatingly beautiful is because it cancels shame and guilt. Just a little simple thing, and I'm I'm a pretty simple person in faith. But if you turn the cross just slightly, it becomes an X. And I hope that the Spirit will help you remember that. Because even if you see it and believe it, the enemy won't quit on you. And he will come again and again to you and tell you, you're gonna have to carry your shame and carry your guilt all of your life. Okay, great, Jesus died, I'll give you that. That's what he's gonna tell you. Okay, okay, I'll give you the resurrection, I'll give you that. But you're gonna have to carry the shame of your past and don't think there's any way around that, okay? And he is a master at manipulating our guilt and shame and strangulating us with it, even in the midst of saying, I, I, I know there's a cross, I, I'm singing about the cross, but you know what, I'm still gonna carry this rock of my failure, of my shame, of my sin, of my guilt. But what Jesus did on the cross was powerful because he didn't just make us good, he made us alive, and when he made us alive, he made us holy in Christ. And that's the power of the gospel. And I hope that you tonight can see Isaiah's prophecy when it says in Isaiah that he made Jesus a guilt offering, a sin offering, and that on Jesus on the cross was the shame of your failure, the shame of it, the reproach of it, What do you call it, the walk of shame? I'm trying to slip out of the condo at at a weird time in the morning. They call that the walk of shame. Maybe somebody saw you in the parking lot and they're like, ah. Or maybe there was no shame. But when you come to see Jesus, things change. And the enemy will come against you. He's coming against some of you so powerfully right now. He's saying, don't believe it, don't believe it. You messed up too much, too many times, too far. You promised God and you broke that promise. You said you wouldn't, but you did anyway. You made a commitment of passion last year. You didn't make it six days after that. So don't think you're gonna do it again. How do you combat that? The only way to combat that is to rotate the cross slightly into an X and go, the devastating beauty of the cross is it is a destroying power and it destroys the lies of the enemy that tell us we've got to carry guilt and shame that was put on the Lord Jesus Christ when he was crucified on our behalf. You are free tonight because of the 
devastating power of the cross to destroy guilt and shame. The third reason why it's devastatingly beautiful is because it's the place where your worth is measured. It kind of ties us back into Ephesians chapter three. You say, well, what does the height and the length and the breadth and the depth of the love of God have to do with the devastating beauty of the cross? Everything, because how do we know the love of God? How do we know the love of God? We know the love of God because of the cross, and without the cross, we don't know the love of God. This is how God loved us, Paul wrote, that even when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In another place in 1 John, it says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that God loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So you don't know love because of your circumstances. You know love because of the circumstance when Jesus Christ gave his life for you so that you could be alive in a relationship with the Father. That's how you know love. So when you look at your circumstances and go, man, I don't think God loves me. No, that's not how you know God loves you because of your circumstances. You know God loves you because of Jesus' circumstance on the cross when he gave his life for you and it's standing there, an immovable object in time and history and eternity and it's shadow is long and it's looming over you right now. And so whenever the enemy comes, circumstances come, darkness comes, anything comes internally or externally against your confidence that you are a loved son or a loved daughter of God, where do you go with that? You simply go again to the cross and say, I know that I am loved by God. How do I know? Look at the cross. He said, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see together with all the saints and to grasp onto how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. So when he described the love of Christ, he painted a cross. It's high. And it's wide. And it's deep. And it's long. It's high enough to get you to a holy God. It's deep enough to go down in your mess to the very bottom and pull you up. It's long enough that no matter how far you've run from God, he is still ahead of you waiting for you to see him. And it is wide enough that there is still the opportunity in this day for God to embrace you and envelop you in his love. How do you know he loves you? because he gave Christ for you. And there will never be a message you will ever hear that will add to that. It's all about seeing it and about believing it and finding finally your value in the devastating beauty of the cross of Christ. It's staggering to me as a casual, semi-casual, somewhat determined observer of your generation, how many of you are walking through life feeling unworthy, not good enough, don't measure up, insignificant, off the radar, Nobody sees, nobody cares. If I weren't here, nobody would even notice. And there's a cross standing in your story today that says, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? When you were down in the muck, in the mire of death, almighty God came down into the muck and the mire and peeled back the muck and picked up you and bit by bit by bit through the power of the death of a perfect sacrifice and the power of one who could champion over death, hell on the grave. He turned your death into life and your sin into sainthood and your object of wrathness into a holy one of God. And you are loved by him tonight. 
No man is ever going to trump that. No girl's going to come along and trump that. No job's going to come along and trump that. No success, no accomplishment, no achievement, no pleasure, no gain is ever going to trump what has already been said. So if you're staring at your phone waiting for somebody to approve you, I just encourage you today, look up at the cross of Jesus Christ and go, I'm not only liked, I'm loved, I'm chosen, I'm valued. I was seen before the foundation of the world, brought into a new family, a adopted by him, raised from the dead, given a new name, son, daughter of almighty God in heaven, that's who I am. I was somebody who, who has great worth to God and I might not have been worthy of Christ, but I was never worthless to Christ. What if you left this stadium tonight and said, I will never again walk unworthy in this world? I don't care what anybody said about me or did to me or what I said to me or did to me, my eyes are open and I just grasped onto something and it was the height and the depth and the width and the length of the love of God in Christ and the devastating beauty of the cross. Then I'll just close by saying another thing that's devastatingly beautiful about the cross is it ends one story and it starts another one. I think this has been in just about every passion message I've shared recently, but if there's anything that I would just dearly desire for God to do tonight, it would be this, and that's to open your eyes to see that at the cross, one story ended and a new story began. And the story that ended is the story of the victim There was a victim, an innocent son of God, a perfect lamb, God in human flesh, never sinned, never thought about sinning, or was tempted to sin. We don't know where his thought process was in that, but never went through with it, honored his father, made a journey from heaven to earth, obeyed God, never quit, never stopped, never gave up on the promise, the plan, the purpose of God for his life. And this Jesus, at the end of the day, was railroaded, okay? He was set up, he was hated, he was unjustly accused, and at the end of it, in a, in a flash, his life was taken from him, and he bled and died an innocent man covered by the guilt and the shame of you and me. So at the end of the day, the innocent one became the guilty one so that the guilty ones could become innocent in him. And you know what? He still has the scars to prove it. When Thomas saw him, he put his hands in him. I don't know if you've ever thought through it or not, but when you see Jesus in heaven, scars, hands and feet inside. Yes, the one in the center of all worship, in the center of all glory, in the center of all affirmation, of praise, of wealth, of power forever and ever and ever. That one whose name is above every name and whose title is above every title. When we see him in heaven and he says, welcome home, well done, good and faithful servant. And he stretches out his arms. We're gonna look at his face, but at some point we're gonna see his wrist and we're gonna go, no way, no way. Those are the scars right there. Those are the, those are the scars, those are the scars. That's the scar. He said, oh, you can touch it if you want. I'm not afraid if you need to put your hands in there, but in that moment, we're not gonna need to put our hands anywhere. We're gonna be seeing fully the victory, the eternal victory of the one who right now is sitting on the throne of thrones, ruling time, ruling authority, waiting for the Father's command to bring all of this to God's conclusion. He is not a victim who needs to be felt sorry for. He is a victor who rules time and eternity. But check it out, he's a victor with scars in his hands and feet. And the power of that is that at the cross, he said, by my wounds you are healed. 
So what got stuck in your hands and feet or heart or mind or body? What blow did you take? What gash did you suffer? What wound tried to take you out? He said, guess what? I have the power by the Spirit through my life in you to heal every wound and to turn it into a scar, which I hope you won't hide because it is proof that you have healed and that you are alive in moving forward in life. I don't know what happened to you and I wouldn't belittle it. I wouldn't come within 100 miles of belittling what happened to you. You got left behind, your family split up, someone abused you, verbally, physically, emotionally, Someone took advantage of you. Someone hit you. Someone forgot about you. Someone promised you and dropped you in despair. The enemies come and attacked you, attacked your mind, attacked your heart, attacked your faith, your confidence. I don't know what you've been through, but what, what I'd like for you to know is that the story of the victim ended at the cross and the story of the victor began in the empty tomb. And in Christ, you're not a victim anymore because you have joined Christ now in his victory parade. That's what the scripture says when it says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. So you can stay the victim. I can stay the victim. You can say, you know what, Louis? Because of what happened to me, it's just gonna be that way. I've got angst. I got anger. I have a certain attitude. I'm never gonna get over it. I'm not gonna get through it. I'm not gonna make it all this stuff you're talking about. I don't know about all that stuff you're talking about. I wanna tell you what God is talking about tonight, not what I'm talking about tonight. He's saying Christ was a victim, victimized for you and victimized for me. He understands what it means to be taken advantage of, but it was his choice so that you and I could come alive from the dead. But in the moment that he came up out of that tomb, he was coming up in victory. Oh, he didn't come unscathed but he came out in victory. He didn't come without blemishes, without scars, without battle scars, but he came out in victory and he said, guess what? When I came out, you came out. Doesn't matter what happened to you. When I came out, you came out. When I came alive, you came alive. When I stepped into victory, you stepped into victory in me. And I'd like to lead you forth now in a victory procession. I, Jesus is saying, am the grand marshal of the victory parade. It is an everlasting parade. I am the person of honor. I ride in the grand marshal float, but guess what? Maybe you were abandoned, maybe you were abused, maybe you were forgotten, maybe you were forsaken, maybe you were let down, maybe you were stabbed in the back, maybe all manner of hell came against you, but guess what? I'm alive and in me you are alive and I would like to invite you, if you'd like to, to come and ride with me in my victory parade. You can end the story of the victim and come sit right here with me in a parade of everlasting, eternal victory. And the power of the gospel is broken people through the power of Christ, through the healing power of Christ, truth about you, that you're alive, that your shame and guilt are canceled, that your worth is measured by the height and the depth 
and the length and the width of the cross of Christ. And he says, I know what it feels like to have a wound. But I also know what it feels like to ride. An unassailed victory. <laughs> would, would, you, would you like to ride? And you have the choice tonight to not see it and not believe it to say, no, I'm just gonna sit right here in the victim and I'm gonna be angry and I'm gonna hurt myself. If anybody gets in my way, I'll hurt them. I'm gonna cut myself at night on my side where nobody can see it and I'm gonna feel the pain of all the crud that's been pushed down into my life. And when I do, and when I, when I feel that pain, it's, it gives me my chance to just go, ah! And you can sit there tonight in the story of the victim. Or you can see it and grasp it and get out of the victim story and come ride with Christ in the victory story. And from this moment on, you could say, yeah, oh, I, you want to see scars? I got scars. But let me show you the Savior who heals all wounds. Do you want to come to the cross and ride with Christ in a parade of everlasting victory? He says, come on. This is the greatest thing on earth. servant king leading his sons and daughters through history into eternity. Oh, but at the, at the very end, because you're like, oh yeah, I want that. This last thing. He always leads us in his triumphal procession in Christ. Check this out. Through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. So I would never say thank you. This is amazing. Uh, <laughs> you're right. Do, do you mind if I drive? No, you, 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 you would, you wouldn't say that. You would say it's your procession. You're the grand marshal. I'm just in it. Woo, thank you. I'm just a love son in your parade. You drive wherever, whenever, to whomever. Make all of us in this parade a fragrant aroma spreading everywhere the knowledge of Christ. That's why Paul said, I don't boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which I'm crucified to this world and this world is crucified to me. I wonder if there's anybody in this stadium tonight who sees a cross that leaves you in a place of saying, this world is dead to me. All of its glitter is fading fast and all I want to do is follow Jesus, spreading the aroma of life to the world. Why would you make that decision? Because it's the only thing that makes dead people alive. That's why you want to live a life that boasts in the cross. It's the only thing that cancels out your friends and your family's guilt and shame. That's why you want to make a life out of boasting in the cross. It's the only thing that tells people in your world how valuable they truly are, unchanging intrinsic worth. That's why you want to boast in the cross. And it is the only thing that can trump whatever has happened to you and lead you into triumph of who you can trust every day of your life. If you see and believe the cross tonight, 
then you're going to cash in your plans. Cash out on what's dangling out there in this world. And you're going to say, take my life, my gifts, my opportunity, my specific passions and skills in life and leverage them like crazy so this world can see the cross, the devastating beauty of the cross of Jesus Christ.